Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 174th session of the online optom learning series, OLS. And for today's session, we have with us Ms. Irene Joseph. Uh, Ms. Irene is currently a senior optometrist at the MediClinic City Hospital in Dubai. She has over two decades of clinical experience after being trained at the Shankar Netralaya in Chennai. She is graduate from the Elite School of Optometry and has a clinical interest and practices all types of specialty contact lenses, including orthokeratology. She also has a past experience in academia where she taught eye care practitioners and was associated with Johnson & Johnson, the Vision Care Institute in Dubai. Her clinical expertise include electrodiagnostics as well as ocular imaging. And she is also a fellow as well as a board member of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. And she's also the secretary of the British Indo-Pacific Orthokeratology Myopia Control Academy, which is the BIPOC. And today, ma'am is going to share her experience and expertise on electrodiagnostics, uh, what it is, how it is relevant to optometry, and how should we go about it. So welcome, ma'am, onto our platform. And you know, without further ado, let me just leave the screen time to you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Fakhsuddin. Thank you for the invite here to talk in this platform. It's a really amazing job that you are doing on this online web series for optometry learning. You know, it's uh, very useful, especially today. I see the crowd is mostly students, which is uh, very good. So, <coughs> good luck to you. So, this is, I think, <coughs> later we shall touch with the electrodiagnostics if you're not practicing it every day. And this is one topic which can be very volatile. You know, it can just uh, we forget about it if you're not practicing. So, it's good to brush up once in a while to know the basics and how we go about uh, ocular diagnostics uh, in the clinic. <clears throat> so let's just proceed with the... So basically, uh, clinical electrophysiology testing is uh, recording the electrical potentials or signals of the visual system, which is evoked by a visual stimuli. So this stimuli can be either a diffuse light or a pattern of light. So basically, we're just checking the response of the system to a particular stimulus. And uh, I should start off with mentioning about the ISF or the International Society for Clinical Electrophysiology of Vision, which is an organization uh, who do a lot of work. Like they have, uh, they have a, a journal which is Documenta Ophthalmologica, which has a lot of uh, articles and cases and studies published all regarding electrodiagnostics. They also promote and extend the knowledge of clinical electrophysiology of vision. Uh, they conduct annual meetings, which is excellent. And uh, all the, they also set protocols and standards for the clinical tests. And everything can be accessed on the ISF website. And they update it regularly. And everybody practicing electrophysiology or learning about electrophysiology, ocular electrophysiology should uh, visit that website and learn from them. So what is the need for these electrodiagnostic testing in a ocular or a eye clinic? So if there's any unexplained visual loss or if there's any uh, objective test and if there's a a visual function change in any given disease that needs to be monitored or to assess the severity of the disease and to also evaluate therapeutic effects of uh, medications and also to assess the eye after some treatment plans. So the various reasons where we need electrodiagnostic testing. To understand that or to decide on what tests we're going to do and how we're going to go about, first we need to understand the visual system. Right. First, we can look at the visual process where when light falls on the eye, it passes through the neurosensory retina and the optic nerve and the optic chiasma, optic tract, and then reaches the visual cortex. And this is how we have vision. Right. So this process needs to be understood. And more importantly, we need to understand the retina itself first for us to decide on which test that we need to do or what test gives us what results. So first, we need to understand the retinal layers. Uh, just quickly, we'll go through this where uh, 
we see here that after the sclera and the choroid and the retinal pigment epithelium the outer retina has the rods and the cones the photoreceptors where they join with the bipolar cells at the outer plexiform layer and uh, then the bipolar cell body forms the inner retina and then they connect to the ganglion cells via the inner plexiform layer and then the axons of the ganglion cells leave the eye as nerve fibers and optic nerve to the brain so this arrangement or the retinal uh, system needs to be understood first before we understand the electrodiagnostic test testing the e function elicit and the electroretinogram the erg and the ganglion cell layer functions can be assessed by the pattern electroretinogram and the nerve fiber layers and the optic nerve function is assessed with the vep or the visually evoked potential test so the retinal and cortical responses measured by electrodes so how we go about these tests the responses are measured by electrodes they are processed by a biosignal amplifier and displayed on a monitor which is actually analyzed by a software first so basically these are the hardware that's needed to do a electrodiagnostic test we do use electrodes which are of different types again they we have the active electrodes we have reference electrodes and we have the ground electrodes so let's look at the a uh, little bit about the electrodes first so this on top is the burian allen electrode which was uh, used initially they come in different sizes it can either be unipolar or bipolar and when it's unipolar uh, it is an active electrode and then a reference electrode is needed but when it's bipolar it does both the active and the reference electrode job and next is the jet electrode which is a corneal it's like a contact lens uh, electrode which comes in contact with the cornea and then we have so these two are corneal electrodes and then we have the gold foil electrode uh, which is uh, gold foil and the dtl electrode so these are conjunctival electrodes which don't really touch on the corneal surface this is important because there are some tests where we need the uh, optical medium to be clear so we don't need any contact lens on the cornea so for those tests we're going to use these electrodes and nowadays there are also the skin electrodes which you can see here at the bottom Uh, which are just placed below the eyelid or uh, just close to the eye and they do not touch any uh, surface of the eye and these are mostly the active electrodes and uh, for the reference and the ground electrodes we use the gold cup or the silver electrode and the instrumentation for electrodiagnostic testing uh, usually these days it's very compact it comes in all in one set which is all placed on one table So here we have a computer which has the software which analyzes the results, and it starts off with the Gansfeld dome that you can see here, and there's also a monitor, a flat uh, LED monitor which uh, is needed to present the pattern stimulus, and the Gansfeld usually is for the flash stimulus, and the monitor which uh, presents the results of the analysis, and this uh, kind of sums up the whole uh, electrodiagnostic system where all the tests can be performed. and these are sometimes also uh, they come along with some handle devices uh, which is for making it more portable you see the baby flash or the handle flash the stimulus is presented via the you know a handled mode so this makes it more portable and it can be used for infants or uh, patients in supine position so all this is uh, needed to uh, it's a complete package to do a electrodiagnostic test and nowadays there are also tests uh, even uh, the complete tests even the erg tests are done in handle uh, instruments which makes it even more compact and portable so what are the tests that we are looking at the full field electroretinogram the pattern electroretinogram the multifocal electroretinogram the visually evoked potential and the eog or the electrococular these are the basic electrodiagnostic tests that will be mostly done in uh, all the uh, eye clinics and it would pretty much cover all the basic uh, uh, results that we need to assess the retina and the optic nerve function so let's look at it one by one the electroretinogram uh, as we know it as the erg is a global response of the retina to a dark uh, to a light stimulus or a pattern stimulus it is done under dark adapted and light adapted conditions okay 
So the electrode uh, positioning for conducting an ERG test is such that the DTL electrode you can see here in this image, it is placed uh, below the lower lid, uh, touching the conjunctiva, of course, and the reference electrodes are here on the sides, on the skin, and on the forehead is the ground electrode. So this is the minimum setup that's needed to measure the uh, ERG. And mostly for uh, subjects over five years and older, we do it with the Gansfeld dome and a chin rest, and there's a fixation point inside. So to perform the ERG mostly, it's the ISF standard protocol that's used. Even though there are, uh, it can be customized and different tests can be done individually, but what we should follow as a standard first step is the ISF protocol. So this includes six steps. Okay, after dark adaptation, we start off with 20 minutes of dark adaptation. And the first test done is the DA.01, which is a rod response. And the second one is the scotopic max response, which is the DA3.0. And the scotopic max response, which is a DA10, which is a brighter flash. And the uh, dark adapted OPs or the oscillatory potentials. So these four tests are done first. And uh, then the eye is light adapted for 10 minutes. And then the photopic response of the cone LA 3.0 and the 30 hertz flicker test is done. So these are done one after the other. And it's done for both eyes. For the ERG recording, the pupils need to be dilated and uh, dark adapted first and done uh, simultaneously for both eyes. So let's look at <coughs> what the ERG does. It enables to distinguish between a generalized outer and inner retinal function, and more predominantly the rod and the cone function. It kind of helps us distinguish between the different layers and their functions. So that is the advantage of an electroretinogram. Even though it's a mass response, it gives us a lot of details about different layers of the retina. So the first, the DA.01 uh, test gives us a waveform here, like the first one here. So this is a, a B wave, and then the dark adapter 3.0 ERG response gives an A wave and a B wave, and similarly the 10.0 ERG. And this the one here in the last is the dark adapted OPs or the oscillatory potentials. And we have the light adapted cone response, and we have the light adapted 30 hertz flicker response. So let's look at each of these and what it indicates. Why do we have all these six protocols? So here, the first one that we saw, the dark adapted 0.01 ERG, is a rod initiated on pathway. So basically, it doesn't have an A wave, and it's a B wave initiated by the uh, rod. And uh, this is an isolated rod response. Okay, And the second one is a combined rod and cone response by a standard flash. So we have an A wave, which is negative, and uh, it's from the rod and the cones of on pathway. And the bipolar, the B wave is from the bipolar cells. And the third wave that we have is a similar combined response, only uh, from a stronger flash. The stimulus is of a stronger flash. See the amacrine cells. And then we have the light flicker, which is a pure cone response. So this is how the ERG test differentiates between the layers of the retina and helps us identify where exactly the problem is. So look at, uh, let's look at this component of the ERG wave. The first one is the A wave. Uh, this is a common ERG wave of the combined response, okay? The rod and cone combined response. So the first one is the A wave, which is a negative deflection. And this arises from photoreceptors. And then it uh, goes into the positive B wave, which uh, reflects the activity of the bipolar cell. And this arises from the bipolar and the molar cells. And next, we have actually on the ascending limb of this B wave are the oscillatory potentials. So uh, in a report of the ERG, we find it as a separate waveform, but actually this is where the OPs arise from. So let's look at the waves specifically and what are the parameters we use from these waves to actually measure or quantify the function of the retina. We're going to look at the implicit time and the amplitude. So implicit time is from like the start of the stimulus to the peak, either the peak of the trough of the A wave or the peak of the B wave. 
and the amplitude amplitude is a voltage magnitude so this is measured from the for the a wave it's measured from the baseline to the a wave trough and for the b wave it's measured from the a wave trough to the b wave peak so this is how the amplitude is measured so we have two values uh, which we uh, use to uh, check if it's within normal limits or if it's affected and that's how we say if the erg is going to be uh, normal or abnormal so let us look at some cases where uh, <coughs> we can see the waves so this first image here is of the normal retina where we have all the six uh, tests and uh, the second image here from top to bottom is the test result from a retinitis pigmentosa eye so you can see here that the first b wave is completely attenuated it's a flat wave look at the normal wave and look at this a uh, flat wave and we also see that the combined max response of the rod and cone is also reduced uh this looks like a uh, pretty much like an advanced rp so there is a little bit of cone involvement already so initially if there's an early stage rp then we will see that there's only the rod only the rod function will be uh, attenuated whereas here we see that the cone is also affected and then we see down here the pure cone which is uh, reduced but still present and next we can see an example of a cone dystrophy so here we see the first wave which is the scotopic blue or the rod response which is present and here on the third after the op is down when we see the 30 hertz flicker and the photopic white response which is flat so indicating that the cones are affected whereas the rods are pre preserved in a rod or in a cone dystrophy <clears throat> the next example is the csnb where it is a again it's a congenital stationary night blindness hereditary disorder where a very typical uh, waveform in the type 2 is present so here we see the rod response is completely attenuated just like an rp but a very typical feature of this is the negative uh, erg or where you see that the a wave is normal but the v uh, the b wave is not as high as it should be in a normal wave okay so here we see that the amplitudes of the b wave are reduced and this is typical of the type 2 csn b and this is how we identify or find out uh, the diagnosis of csnd with the, the erg so a negative wave is a very clear indication and it appears in certain conditions and this is picked up very well in the erg test to make a diagnosis especially with the even with cros uh, there is a the ba wave ratio is reduced so this is what we have to look at in uh, certain conditions to make a diagnosis so here we see negative erg Uh, appearing in all these conditions the juvenile retinoschisis coats disease myotonic dystrophy aguchi's disease and the batens disease too so this is something we have to look out for in ergs <coughs> and this lists a little uh, some common indications for erg tests when there's a photoreceptor dysfunction or when there's a disease in the inner retina or if there's a disease uh, of the macula so for all these conditions uh, erg is indicated next let's look at the multifocal erg this is another type of erg where uh, we saw that the full field erg is a mass response of uh, the retina whereas the multifocal erg is like it gives us local ergs from different areas on the retina okay this technique allows for simultaneous recording of focal erg so initially we had a focal erg even before the full field erg where only from a uh, retina uh, the erg from one particular point of the retina was measured and then came the full field erg uh, but then we did not have information about certain areas of the retina we only had a mass response so now with multifocal erg we are able to record individual ergs from different parts of the retina wherever the stimulus falls on the retina that part is measured uh the stimulus is basically is not a flash of light it's uh, an array of black and white hexagons so these hexagons are generated by a sequence uh, m sequence and they are uh, a flash on the retina and they divide the retina into depending on the number of the retina is divided into that many parts either 61 or 103 
three hexagons uh, mostly hexagons is more of a standard and these ergs or uh, responses are cone driven so they are under and they are done under light adapted condition so there's no dark adaptation light adaptation it's done under acro adaptation of the eye uh, for room uh, illumination or a particular illumination and the light adapted uh, cone responses are uh, achieved with this multifocal erg and to perform this test the optical quality is very important so the uh, subject is placed about 30 cm in front of the stimulus and uh, fixation is very important and refraction should be in place to get a clear image of the hexagons so here we see that uh, this is an uh, Uh, example of how the stimulus looks the a the first one shows about 61 hexagons and the second one is about 103 hexagons so the number of hexagons actually depend or uh, infers the number of parts the retina is divided into and horizontally any of the any number of hexagons the whole stimulus will uh, extend to about 40 to 50 degrees of the field or 40 to 50 degrees of the retina is measured so what do we get the result from this multifocal erg is again a biphasic wave okay if you see this wave there's the initial negativity of n1 and then there's a positive p1 and again there is a negative n2 so this is kind this is the kind of wave that we will get it is very similar to the erg wave or the a and b waves of the erg but it's not exactly that these are mathematical extractions okay so these don't exactly uh relate to the a and b wave but it is similar to the a and b waves of the full field erg so even here we measure the amplitude and the time the implicit time so the amplitude is measured again from the n1 trough to the p1 peak so that's the value that we take and quantify to measure the function of the retina so when do we do this multifocal erg it's indicated to detect diseases of the outer retina which affects the cone photoreceptors and the bipolar cells and it is also used for investigation of central and paracentral maculopathies so since this stimulus falls in the central retina it it gives you the function of the central retina and mostly the maculopathies and it's a cone photoreceptor uh, derived uh, result and another indication is for hydrochloroquine toxicity so there are uh, conditions where uh, hydrochloroquine is given for some rheumatic problems so this can be toxic to the retina and there is a, a certain uh, amount of medication that needs to be given and for some people even the allowed amount can be toxic so basically when any patient is started off with hydrochloroquine they send them for an eye exam where we do a baseline test okay to check the retina and in that multifocal erg is also an indication which can give you an objective measure okay even before the perimetry can show any changes because of changes in the retina in the outer retina uh, it can be picked up with multifocal uh, ergs and more so uh, even for follow ups to see if it's uh, progressing or if it's getting worse or if it's already there then they kind of change the treatment plan so for that also multifocal erg is very important and it is also for the assessment of the posterior pole involvement in any peripheral retinopathies so like in rp in retinitis pigmentosa where the periphery starts getting affected and then the uh, central the posterior pole is spared but the multifocal erg can give an objective measure of uh, how much of the posterior pole is involved if the fovea is getting involved or the macula area is getting involved so that can be assessed with the multifocal erg even in Uh, cases of peripheral retinopathies and also for the investigation of local retinal defects so like i said the, the multifocal erg helps uh, helps you to give like a topography of the retinal uh, involvement or the retinal damages so we can find out any localized uh, defects on the retina so let's see how we report this the multifocal erg has can be reported the values are reported in different ways the first one is the trace array where those waves that we saw from each hexagon is mapped out and it gives you a <clears throat> like a field effect of the uh, problem in the retina or if it is normal so here you see that the amplitudes of all the waves are kind of similar so this is like a normal retina 
and uh, if any area is particularly affected then we can see that the waves will get smaller and uh, it will or either be distinguished so we can find out easily which part of the retina is affected so these amplitudes are also plotted in a 3d map so here you see that the central the fovea has the highest amplitude and hence it's a high peak and then the amplitude towards the periphery slowly reduces and then it becomes flat so this is a 3d uh, response density plot which gives again a topographical view of the strength of each unit or uh, signal now uh, this is if you see this as a retinas average of the amplitudes in that area and here you will get the values so these are the amplitude values that you are going to check okay so here if you see the area green is the first wave so the area here is the amplitudes of this area is averaged out and given as a value here so the 16.2 is the amplitude of this particular quadrant and the next quadrant orange is here down so number 4 this is the average of the quadrant orange quadrant so if you see the values this is 16 and this is 32 so we can clearly see that uh, the quadrant green this side is kind of less amplitude than the quadrant orange indicating some changes in the retina and there's also another way to check which is the ring uh array which is a uh, ring averages so here what we do here we divided the retina into quadrants and here we divide the retina into rings starting from the fovea so the ring 1 in the middle is the fovea and then the parafovea areas are ring 2 and then ring 3 and the amplitudes are averaged in each ring and given here so here we will be able to check if there is any uh, pro problem with the retina which is circular so mostly for hydrochloric Uh, hydrochloroquine toxicity we check this ring ratios and we see because this kind of affects the medication kind of affects the retina in the second between 5 degrees to 15 degrees of the red from the fovea so the parafovea areas need to be watched hence we check ring 2 and ring 3 these rings ring 2 and ring 3 the values of these rings are watched when we check for hydrochloroquine toxicity So here's another example of the Staggers disease, where multifocal ERG results uh, typically are uh, reduced in the foveal area. So you can see here, if you can see the waves, right? The amplitudes are much higher in the periphery, and in the central area, it's reduced. Similarly for ARMD, you can also see that the 3D image, the peak is uh, completely uh, not present. So the foveal area is completely affected in the ARMD showing. reduction in the central macular responses so this is another picture of the hydrochloroquine toxicity where you see the fovea is flat the cone is uh, <coughs> the peak is high at the fovea whereas the amplitudes are reduced around that area so this is where the ring 2 and the ring 3 gets affected and we'll be able to detect any toxic changes in the retina so it helps to detect the dysfunction of the outer retina and where the, where exactly the toxic damage happens and the next one is the pattern erg <coughs> what is the pattern erg it's a local response of the retina to a pattern stimulus so in uh, full field erg we have a flash stimulus and in pattern erg we have a, a checkerboard stimulus which covers about 15 to 20 degrees of the retina and it is done at about 80 cm or 1 meter distance the patient sits 1 uh, meter from the monitor and this is displayed on a monitor and it is a measure of the central retinal function and also an evaluation of the retinal ganglion cell so how does this occur this test is done uh, of course the electrode setup is similar to that of the erg the full field erg and even for the multifocal erg the electrodes are fixed in a similar way like the full field erg and uh, there's a, a corneal or conjunctival uh, mostly for and for pattern erg it is uh, a must that the cornea needs to be clear so no corneal or lens uh, active electrode is used a conjunctival electrode is used and the reference and the ground electrodes are also used so how do we get the pattern or the waveform on a pattern erg so we see that there is an initial negative deflection at about uh, 35 milliseconds followed by a positive deflection at about 45 to 60 milliseconds that's the p50 
and then there is a negative deflection again at at about uh, 90 to 100 milliseconds which is the n95 so the components that we are going to look at on a pattern eog report is the p50 and the n95 so the p50 component is derived from the activity or the cellular activity distal to the ganglion cells so mostly it's going to reflect the macular function and uh, the n95 component is generated by ganglion cell activity and typically it's abnormal or extinguished in optic nerve diseases so these are the two components that we have to look at on a pattern eog so what are the indications again dysfunction of the optic nerve and also most importantly it's okay most importantly it's used to distinguish between a macular and an optic nerve problem okay so this is like a flow chart as to how we go about using pattern erg so when we do a pattern erg and we see that it's normal in a pattern vep is also normal and generally also it is a norm that uh, a vep test should be done along with a pattern erg or a full field erg a vep test as a stand alone will not give uh, much information so when pattern erg is done along with vep and if both are normal then the problem or the defective vision is not because of any organic reason and if the pattern erg is normal and if the vep is abnormal then we can know that it's a optic nerve dysfunction and not a macular problem and if the p50 is normal again and the n95 is abnormal and the pattern vep is also abnormal then for sure we know that it is an optic nerve problem because the p50 is spared that is the macula is spared and if the p50 is abnormal then definitely we know that there's a macular issue and then we have to proceed with doing the full field erg to know if it is a just a macular it's a generalized retinal dysfunction or if it's a maculopathy so di to differentiate that after pattern erg we have to do a full field erg so all these tests like you see are interconnected between uh, depending on which part of the retina is affected so you have to uh, do it in conjunction with each other so any test stand alone is not going to give you any uh, full information and for that it is important to know the physiology of the eye too so the next one is the visually evoked potential which is a gold standard you know for uh, <coughs> checking the you know visual cortex so it is a signal basically the evoked potential is a signal generated by the visual cortex in response to a visual stimuli okay and it measures the functional integrity of the visual system from the retina to the optic uh, via the optic nerve to the visual cortex so how do we go about doing the vep test okay this test has can be done with two different kinds of uh, stimuli one is a pattern stimuli and the other is a flash stimuli the most preferred and most standard test is the pattern vep and even in this the pattern can be either be an on or onset offset uh, pattern uh, but mostly it's the pattern reversal vp that is uh, done on a regular basis and uh, only if there's nystagmus or if there's any fixation issues then we can do the onset offset uh, pattern and uh, if the visual acuity should also be good with no media haze then the pattern vp is more reliable and it's done with two sizes of checkerboard one is a 1 degree and one is the 0.25 degree and the flash vp is just a, a flash strength of 3 candela per meter square uh, generally flashed on the retina and this is mostly done in infants or in uh, anybody with media opacity where you know the pattern cannot uh, be clearly uh, put on the retina then flash vp is used and uh, with any media opacity due to corneal opacity mainly or cataracts and hemorrhages where we are not able to look through the eye and see the retina so how do we go about vp testing this is similar to the pattern erg where the stimulus is presented on a monitor and uh, the distance is similar about 70 to 80 or 1 meter distance depending on the instrument that you have and the electrodes are placed uh, skin electrodes are used and the positioning of the electrodes the active ground and reference are according to the international 1020 system so here we see that the active electrode is placed on the oz position okay and the reference electrode is placed on the fz position on the forehead and the ground is placed on the vertex at the cz position 
so the active electrode is basically on the visual part of the cortex on the visual scalp and uh, skin electrodes are the same gold cup or the silver cup electrodes so this is the electrode positioning and this is the patient testing position for the vep test and what is the result that we get again it is a waveform which contains a negative component at uh, about 75 milliseconds and there's a positive component at about 100 milliseconds and there's a negative component at about 135 milliseconds so this is a normal vep wave pattern okay and again a positive potential here at 100 milliseconds the main uh, uh, parameter we are going to look at is the p100 the latency and the implicit time so here we see that the amplitude again is from the trough to the peak that's how the amplitude is measured and from the start time to the peak time is the implicit time so this was a wave pattern of a typical pattern reversal stimuli okay if the stimuli is a pattern onset offset vp then the wave pattern is different okay it's a uh, the it's uh, the nomenclature is like c1 c2 and c3 and a flash vp which is also uh, commonly done is mostly with a p1 n2 p2 and n3 and the components that we have to focus on a flash vp are the n2 which falls at around 90 milliseconds and the p2 which peaks at about 120 milliseconds the iso protocol is for a single channel vp and uh, if we need to find out any uh, issues or dysfunction at the chiasmal or post chiasmal visual pathway then we need to do a multi channel recording okay <clears throat> so how do we report the vp again with the amplitude and latency so what are we looking at is a uh, if the latency if there's a delay or if it is uh, not delayed okay so a delay in latency indicates an optic nerve problem with the anything to do with the myelination and a reduction in amplitude is associated with any atrophy or compression issue okay and also what we have to notice is the latency between the two eyes if there's an uniocular problem then we have to notice that the latency would be way too different between the two eyes example in retrobulbar neuritis so here there's an example i can show you of uh, optic neuritis where uh, if you can see the values here you can see that the p100 the latency p the implicit time is around 105 in the right eye and about 145 in the left eye so we can see that there's a delay or uh, the in the latency in the left eye because of optic neuritis and okay and here in the second example here we can see if you see the values here the latency values are 104 in the right eye and about 103.3 in the left eye okay but the amplitude is reduced so this is because of a compression problem the amplitude in the right eye is 11.5 and the amplitude here is about 3 so that difference even in amplitude needs to be noticed so that we can distinguish if it is a problem with the myelination or if it's an atrophy so this is the kind of uh, reports that we see with a vp if you see here in optic neuritis problems there is a marked latency okay and any ischemic uh, optic nerve problems uh, the latency may be delayed or may be slightly delayed or maybe not but the amplitude is predominantly reduced and even in compression lesions so this is how we differentiate in diagnosis using a vp value okay so in the absence of any obvious fundus abnormality then a pattern vp in combination with pattern erg or multifocal erg can help distinguish between optic nerve function and a macular function and these are the other indications that vp is used for uh so the last test here we'll look at is the electrooculogram which basically records the what is electrooculogram it records the it is a record of the resting potential in the eye or the retinal pigment epithelium okay and how this is measured is it is the trans epithelial potential in the rpe uh, which is of a very few millivolts 
and uh, it is also it also depends on the photoreceptor integrity for the eog to be normal so uh, it's mostly used in conjunction with erg but very specifically in certain conditions it helps to distinguish or make a diagnosis like example for in the best disease where only the rp layer is affected uh, generally there is a normal erg and the eog values are affected so let's just see how we uh, assess that okay to measure the erg we are going to use uh, skin electrodes uh, in the inner and outer cantha of the eye inner cantha and outer cantha and there's a ground this is the this is fixed on each eye and there's a ground electrode fixed uh, usually on the forehead okay and uh, the stimulus is going to be either on a screen or the gansfeld dome where two lights are placed uh, 30 degrees apart so when we perform the test it's going to create circuits the eye is going to move from one light to the other creating circuits and this will alter the potential between the cornea and the retinal pigment epithelium so this altered potential will be measured by the electrodes and that we account as the rp's function so how do we go about this is done or uh, the slow oscillation is generally the standard and it's done first 15 minutes in the dark and then 15 minutes in the light so basically the electrodes are fixed and the patient is asked to look at the red light uh, shift between the red light which uh, moves from one uh, position to the other okay and at about in the dark at about and this potential what happens it changes right so at about 12 minutes it reaches the minimum in the dark okay and then after the 15 minutes is completed when the test is performed in the light this potential again reaches the highest point at about 7 to 12 minutes again so these two values are measured and the ratio of this light peak and the dark trough is recorded as the lpdt ratio or previously it was known as the ardens ratio or the eog ratio so nowadays the reporting is a little different we need to measure the ratio and also mention the dark trough amplitudes and the light phase peak time the lp time okay this is how we need to record the eog and uh, usually uh, the ratio uh, ranges between 1.7 and 4.3 so anything less than 1.7 is considered as abnormal ratio that means the eog value is abnormal and the rp is affected and the uh, lp time is between 7 to 12 minutes okay so we saw all these uh, standard tests and uh, there are st standard protocols uh, which needs to be followed because if these tests are not conducted in a correct manner then the results are not uh, comparable okay so we need to follow the isf standards and these electrodiagnostic tests along with the clinical findings will help us to diagnose many conditions and also monitor the disease progression and also serve as a functional marker for assessing therapeutic efficacy so this is how we use the electrodiagnostic test thank you all right thank you thank you so much uh, ma'am for that uh, you know comprehensive uh, presentation and taking us through all the three electrodiagnostic tests uh which we routinely know about and you know clarifying a lot of doubts and as you started in the beginning it's kind of a thing which is very volatile we tend to forget things and it's not something True. which we do every day right <laughs> it's something which we yes. do it indicated so it's always good to keep on recapping it and thank you for making that easy for us now or uh, just out of curiosity uh mm -hmm. how frequently do you do electrodiagnostics i mean what what's the frequency let's say in a week you see 20 patients actually uh, i uh, am in a multidisciplinary hospital so okay. we have a lot of uh, and also we are a tertiary referral center for electrodiagnostics so oh, okay. uh, it's not, of course we don't have as much population as in india that we used to do before in shankar netralya but yeah. here we do a lot of uh, ergs and uh, multifocal ergs and mostly vps vps are the uh, more common tests because we have a neuro department uh, so we have a lot of referrals for uh, neurological cases for uh, vps so, so we do around say uh, at least uh, like say 5 to 
uh, in a week for VEPs and electrodiagno the other retinal dysfunctions we have about uh, in a month say 10 to 15 cases it's not as much but uh, definitely uh, it's like being uh, the very few centers maybe two or three centers in the country so we do have uh, many patients right right so that's uh, that's good to know because all that uh uh, when you are working into a multi-speciality, you get all that uh, expertise and opportunities to do. And, true, true. and, and the instrumentation is not uh, available as well easily to... Exactly. Right? Actually, yeah. it, was, uh, it was surprising. Like when I initially, when, we, uh, when I came here, that uh, we did not uh, have any electrodiagnostic set up in the whole country. And our hospital was the first to have it. And for about three or four years, we were the only hospital having electrodiagnostics in the whole country. So oh. uh, then it kind of uh, picked up and now we have a lot of reference. Right, right. Okay, great. So that that's uh, really useful. And just coming to some questions which came up on the chat. Uh, the first is uh, when you are doing the VEP, uh, do you prefer... To do it in a dilated state or a non-dilated state? Is there a preference? Uh, should we dilate the patients yes. or not? <clears throat> no, actually VEP is done. Mostly the pattern VEP should be done undilated. Okay. And even for the flash VEP, it is not necessary. You need to dilate the eyes. It's also uh, the standard protocol is uh, to be done undilated because uh, the pattern needs to be clearly uh, on the retina, you know. Uh, seen clearly so it has to be undilated and also the refraction the patient should be refracted to that distance so mm. that the vision is clear only then a pattern VEP uh, makes sense otherwise it would be a unreliable result and anyway the and for any reason the vision is less than 2200 then uh, we have to do a flash VEP and not a pattern but even for flash VEP it need not be dilated Okay, so so that that's again a good thing because uh, if you want to dilate again, you have some regulations of dilatation. But again, if you are into a clinical practice, patient might be dilated. But independent practitioners who want to go into this, yes. uh, it's not it's not a kind of a mandate to dilate, and it's good to not dilate when you are doing the VP, as you mentioned. Okay, uh, another question is uh, any tips on. Uh, Avoiding artifacts when you do, uh, you know, electrodiagnostic. Anything which you must be yeah, very yeah. careful. Even, even to only one uh, term. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe yes. Uh, maybe I did not include this part because it's too much of details and uh, you know all the procedures to how to perform each test is very detailed out in the ISF website where they provide. Uh, standards for each test okay and very clearly they've detailed out how to go about these tests but yes how to avoid artifacts is when we uh, fix the electrodes uh, we do have to check the impedance all right so the impedance needs to be within uh, five or ten depending on which test kilo ohms so once we fix the electrodes uh, correctly and the uh, impedance is well within the acceptable limits we know that there is not going to be uh, any artifacts in the testing and the testing is going to be perfect. Okay, The result that we get is going to be perfect. But other ways, if uh, apart from the electrode artifact, the other artifacts is that the electrodiagnostic setup has to be, it can't be done in your regular refraction room or you know, in a place where it's you have multiple tests. So it has to be a specific uh, room and it has to have its own... Uh, uh, lighting and uh, that is the reason for electrodiagnostic setup even though all the manufacturers come up with the their normative data and you know the values they give you it's definitely not going to be as good as the normative data that you create in your own clinic because the room illuminance and uh, the instrumentation the electrode that you use all this will alter the normative data okay so every clinic needs to create their own normative data for each of the tests, okay, and then they have to compare it with the patient's data. And the artifacts, uh, I, I'm not sure if this would answer correctly. The, the two things I can think of is the electrodes. If the electrodes are well fixed and, uh, you know, then the impedance is good, then the artifacts are uh, avoided. And the room setup, there should not be extra noise, electrical activity in the room, and all that can avoid the artifacts. 
I hope that answers. Yeah, yeah. And uh, during what indicate what is the best indication to do VEP test? If I understand this question correctly, in what patients do you think that uh, VEP test? Probably is the you, best? when you think you need to do a VEP test, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So VEP test first thing is when there's an unexplained visual loss. Okay, right. that's the first reason I can think of for a VEP test. You have a patient, uh, you don't see anything on the retina, the fundus is good, uh, the media is clear, uh, but there's a visual equity is less, either uniocular or bi binocular. So then that's the first reason we do a VP test. Or if there's already a condition, you know, the patient has already had an optic neuritis, has come for follow-up, then we also have to do the VP test as a follow-up. So I think unexplained visual loss or painful visual loss are the reasons that we first think of doing a VP test. Great. And uh, any any other tips on probably we have non-cooperative patients and you get some disturbances or noise uh, because of the test mm. performance due to their uncooperative sure, sure. nature. Uh, any tips on that to improve the quality of the reports? Would, would you like to do them again? Would you like do multiple reports or anything yes apart. yes if there's a lot of noise or for some reason you don't get a good impedance and if there's a lot of artifact then definitely we have to repeat it okay mm -hmm. because uh, otherwise it's not going to be a reliable uh, report right okay and uh, in cases of uh, visually impaired patients using VP or ERG, is it an essential part of low vision routine examination? Do you think that will help us or is it really important to perform those uh, electrodiagnostics, especially for visually impaired patients? So again, yes, if it's visual impairment, uh, definitely if there's a visual impairment, then you need a reason for that visual impairment, right? If you already have made a diagnosis, uh, you know, then it's not mandatory, but if you have a visual impairment and you don't know what is the reason, then definitely uh, electrodiagnostic test uh, should be done so that we can analyze more the function of the retina or the optic nerve to find out what is the reason for that impairment in vision. Right. Right. So because they only said low vision patient, but uh, if they are also, if they want to know that if there's already, we know the reason, then like say for uh, RP, mm. uh, we know that nothing can be done like clinically right now, right? But still we have to do an ERG because we need to know how much of involvement is already there or how much of function is left or how fast it's progressing or is the uh, central retina involved already? So for all these, we need to do the electrodiagnostic test. You know, even if we know the diagnosis of a low vision patient and if we have to do it. Right. And again, it will depend on what are we suspecting? Which for the question? Right. Yeah. And the, the, the other add on question would be like, would you depend on what you are suspecting to choose whether you want to do an ERG or a VP? Would it depend mm -hmm. on your clinical finding to choose whether you want to do an ERG or a VP or you yes. would rather do yes. both for all patients? Is there something which you would look at? No, generally we need to choose. Okay. But the standard is always a VP and an ERG. Okay. Okay. If there is a, a impairment in vision and uh, if there is a retinal condition, if we know it is a retinal condition, if it's a retinal degeneration or dystrophy, we straight away go for ERG. But if we do not know the reason, then VP and ERG go together. Okay. All right. So that that uh, is useful in that we question. We have to do both. Both. Yeah. Okay, a uh, couple of questions are more towards the technique and, you know, kind of thing when when it comes to examining. So, uh, this is more of the adaptation process. Would you do a light adaptation condition test first, then do a dark adaptation or is there a normative way of performing uh, the test? Excellent, right. excellent. I'm glad this question came up because uh, for ERG, if we are doing both, if we need to do both, of course, that is the standard protocol. There are certain protocols, like I said, where they do only light adapted or only dark adapted, but that's for different reasons. But as a standard protocol, when we do ERG, we have to do the dark adapted first because we want proper dark adaptation, right? We do not want the retina to be exposed to any light 
and uh, even we should not be doing a fundus examination before erg and we should not take fundus images because the flashes are uh, pretty bright so uh, we have to do the dark adaptation first just to make sure that the dark adaptation is done well otherwise in 20 minutes if you're going to do a light adapted and flash the lights and or do a fundus exam flash lights or click photos flash lights and then do dark adaptation then 20 minutes is not enough we have to adapt for a longer time so preferably for convenience sake it's better to do the dark adapted test first great and how about kids when you are doing for you know younger kids and if they are sleeping would that be uh, a con- would that would that be an opportunity for us to do a vp test or do you want them to be awake and are there differences because of difference yeah actually uh, it's a uh, pretty tricky because pattern we if you want to do then of course the kids going to be sitting up and uh, you know looking at the pattern but if it's flash vp it's better if the child is not moving too much okay so that can bring in a lot of artifacts for vp the mm. movement uh, the head movements the eye movements so it is a good thing if the child is sleeping and because we do even flash vps uh, under anesthesia or under sedation because if they are very young so because if they are awake they move a lot so that can make it very unreliable so a sleeping and a less moving child is better than an awake and moving child yes yeah, okay. in that way that's right and any age limits uh, when you do electrodiagnostic any younger the age you should do and any older the age you shouldn't do or something like that or can it be performed for all age groups i don't think there is a, a cut off for uh, age but we have to see depending on the age we'll only have to see how we go about doing the test you know yeah. so like i said for, for uh, vp it's better to do a pattern vp but if the child is uh, way too young if it's an infant then we cannot do a pattern vp right so we have to do a flash vp so these are the things that the age might decide so there's nothing that you know at this age we should not do the it will only depend it will only uh, indicate what type and how to go about the test the age right so you you have to choose whether flash or pattern or multifocal yeah yes. what it will just help us to choose the t- test type rather than yes and how to go about how yeah more than whether to do it or not right okay we are just taking one last question here and it says about the refractive error uh, which you mentioned so the refractive error should be corrected and it's good to have the correction in place how would you recommend to correct the patient is it contact lenses is it full aperture or small aperture lenses should it be a spherical equivalent or does the instrument give us some values on how do we sure. go about that actually it should be the full correction okay and correct them for that uh, a full correction is the best a spherical equivalent if it's high cylinder it's going to again distort the pattern and uh, a contact lens if possible is best because it will not obscure any of the sides so either contact lenses or full at aperture lenses we don't use we generally don't use the patient's own glasses uh, prefer not to because it might be of various sizes but if it's a large it's fine but a full aperture lens or a contact lens is better awesome great so i think uh, with that we have taken all questions which popped up on the chat thank you so much ma'am for sharing that uh, with us and you know answering the questions uh, i see some sure, messages that already came up that it's been a easy presentation and thank you for uh, you know taking us through that journey with very ease okay that, that, that was uh, i hope i you know i made it a little easier to understand or in simple words because that's one thing uh, we kind of run away from electrodiagnostics right it sounds too complicated it looks too complicated but uh, it's actually if you understand the electrophysiology of the eye then understanding electrodiagnostic tests is very easy that's right yeah and i think after today we will be not be so much scared and we probably would see the reports <laughs> back and uh, you know look into it and uh, it's a good thing to be to know and refer the patients if you don't have the facility so at least you get those tests done from to and also most importantly as optometrists we should not stop with just doing the test you know um, my main thing is 
we need to know how to uh, interpret the test we need to know to decide what test to do and interpreting uh, the, and understanding the results is more important than just performing the test you that's know that's right. what we should do as optometrists yeah very well put that yeah thank you so much again for that uh, wonderful session and uh, sure. for answering the questions yeah sure welcome take care everybody yeah most welcome uh, we do have a session planned next weekend uh, as we said in the earlier sessions now we are moving on to two or three sessions a month preferably alternate weeks until then take care be safe and i hope to see you next week bye bye thank you ma'am bye